Black Dahlia. You may have heard the name at least once or even twice, but did you know that the name Black Dahlia originally stems from the case of a woman who was split in half on the sidewalk of an LA neighborhood? On January 16th, 1947, Betty Bursinger was on a walk with a three-year-old daughter in a Los Angeles neighborhood when they came across a lifeless woman without any clothing on. Okay, that would be super traumatic if I was a three-year-old and I saw that. But when I say lifeless, that's like not even a question. The woman was cut in half at the waist. But here's the weird part. Not that that whole part isn't weird, is that there wasn't any bodily fluid around the area. Now, based on the placement and cleanliness of the corpse, Betty first thought it was a mannequin. But once she made the realization that it was a human, Betty called the police. I think that's a smart move on your part, Betty. Good job. Police officers arrived at the scene. Early on in the investigation, officers sent copies of the woman's fingerprints to the FBI using sound, fo so sound photo? An early form of a fax machine? What the, that sounds old, that sounds like dial up. The prints were identified as a match to the woman named Elizabeth Short. Her prints were previously on file after she was arrested for underage drinking. Elizabeth's body was in a mutilated state. It was drained of fluid, which then left her skin a sickly white complexion. A knife was taken to her mouth, giving her a gruesome laceration, making her look like the Joker. Whoever did this to Elizabeth had also washed her body and appeared to have had strategically staged her remains in this way. The only evidence found near the scene was a heel print on the ground and an empty cement bag with liquid stains on it. Then an autopsy was performed. Elizabeth was determined to have passed away one or two days prior to her discovery. She had several marks on her body. We don't need to go into detail, but we just know it was bad. Like, like bad, like really bad. Based on the grisly nature of Elizabeth Short's demise, her case became one of the most publicized events of that time. They called her the Black Dahlia. The nickname was a wordplay reference to the film, The Blue Dahlia. Photos and details of Elizabeth's passing and discovery were plastered in newspaper all over town. But get how twisted this next part is. But like, not like that whole other part wasn't twisted. This part gets even more twisted. Reporters from the Los Angeles Herald Express newspaper were the first to contact Elizabeth's mother. They first told her that Elizabeth won a beauty pageant and they wanted her to fly out to Los Angeles? What is that? This made them the first news outlet to cover the mother's response to her daughter's brutal exit to this world. That is seriously messed up. So who was Elizabeth Short? A 22-year-old Hollywood hopeful, originally born in Boston, Massachusetts. When Elizabeth was six, her father staged his own passing and moved to California. Okay, seriously, who does that? This was right around the same time that the stock market crashed and where Elizabeth's dad lost all of his money. That kind of sounds like a little bit of a coincidence. Many years later, Elizabeth's mom got a letter from her supposedly deceased husband. He apologized to his wife for deceiving them and told her he started a new life in California. Oh, like that's gonna fix that. Elizabeth then moved to California to live with her father. Who does that? Less than a year later, she moved out of her dad's house after they got into several arguments. After that, she bounced around between Florida and Massachusetts, but ended up back in California. Up until her passing, Elizabeth lived in Los Angeles working as a waitress. She took on a few modeling jobs here and there, but she apparently wanted to make a career for herself as an actress. The last time Elizabeth was seen, she was at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. She was there to meet her sister who was visiting from Boston. She was last seen making phone calls in the hotel lobby on December 9th. No one knows what happened to her between the 9th and the day that she was discovered on the 16th. So what was discovered about her passing? And who did it? After the story of the Black Dahlia hit the news, many people sent letters confessing to the act. Why would, why would they do that? Many of the letters were sent to the press adding to the Black Dahlia media frenzy. On January 24th, a sketchy manila envelope was flagged by an employee from the post office. It was addressed to the Los Angeles news outlets. There was a note that read, here is Dahlia's belongings, letters to follow. Inside was Elizabeth's birth certificate, photos, business cards, and pieces of paper with names written on them. And an address book belonging to a man named Mark Hansen. Now who's this Mark Hansen guy? 
The envelope was wiped clean with gasoline to destroy any fingerprints. Well, two fingerprints were still recovered, but they were compromised in transit and couldn't be tested. That same day, a purse and shoe were found on top of a garbage can in an alleyway, two miles away from where Elizabeth was found. The shoe and bag were also cleaned with gasoline. Mark Hansen became the main suspect after they discovered his address book in the sketchy package. He was a rich nightclub owner who reportedly knew Elizabeth, but he was eventually cleared from the case. During the heat of the investigation, over 150 potential suspects were interviewed. That's a lot of people. There was no solid proof or evidence tying anyone to the case, and a reward was even put out for anyone who could provide information leading to the perpetrator. Many people came forward, but their claims were all false and they were later charged with obstruction of justice. As they should, who comes forward to a crime that they didn't commit? Now, there were no new leads and the case went cold for years. It has become known as one of the most famous unsolved slangs in American history. But when a man by the name of Steve Hodell began going through his late father's belongings, he was led to believe that his father was responsible for the infamous slayings. In his father's things, Steve found two pictures of a young woman that looked exactly like Elizabeth. He investigated more evidence from the crime scene to see if he could find anything else that would tie his father to the case. In one of the photos taken at the scene of the crime, Elizabeth's body was clearly segmented following a specific style taught only in the 1930s. And this is when Steve's father, George, was in medical school. Hmm. The handwriting for the suspicious package sent to the press matched George's handwriting. Steve found a receipt for construction done to his childhood home. One of the receipts was for 10 bags of concrete, the same size and the same brand as the bag found on the scene of the crime. Ding, 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 ding! We have a winner! Well, I mean, I don't know if winner's the right word, but all of these pieces of evidence started to add up for Steve. He concluded that his father committed the crime and eventually went on to write a book about it. Investigators have yet to confirm Steve's father as the perpetrator. The Black Dahlia case is still unsolved to this day. And you know what I still can't get over? Is the fact that Elizabeth's dad faked his own demise to get out of Dodge. And not only that, but why did Elizabeth think that it was okay to move in with him after all of that? Like, oh, okay, you faked your own passing and made me believe that you were deceased for over 10 years? How about I just move in with you? That doesn't make any sense. But do you know what does make sense? Is curry roasted cauliflower and sweet potato salad. I'm so excited.